I want you to be thinking about this title of our sermon tonight that is overwhelmed, but not overcome. As we look at this particular chapter in God's Word. Now, we live in a world that is replete with problems. Job said in the long ago that man is born of woman and is of a few days and full of trouble. But life is often beset by trials and tribulations and troubles. But the psalmist here really depicts the troubles that he was experiencing. And some would say that this particular psalm was written while God's people were in captivity. That being Babylonian captivity. And if that be the case, then one could understand why that he would pen this particular psalm. And the despair that permeates this particular beautiful psalm recorded so many, many years ago. And so as we look at Psalm 77 tonight, and as we contemplate the title, Overwhelmed But Not Overcome, the first thing that I would call to your attention, it has to do with the trials of his adversities. The trials of or his adversities. And make no mistake about it. His trials, his tribulations, his troubles were very real to him. And sometimes it's difficult or it may be difficult for us to understand what others are going through. We, we don't know the whole story, right? And maybe we have difficulty emphasizing or even sympathizing with the trials and the tribulations that others are facing in life. So the psalmist here, when he writes about the problems that he's experiencing, those trials and those troubles were very real to him. And so in a very profound way, he makes these points to those that would read this particular psalm. First of all, I want to call your attention to his sorrows in life. And there are really three things that he sets forth for us right here that has to do with his sorrows and to help us to gain insight into really the depth, the depth of those sorrows that he was experiencing. He points out here, number one, that he was discomforted. Look at verse two. He says, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I, I could not, well, I, could, I would imagine that there are times in life when it's difficult because of the death of the problems that we might be experiencing. That it's very difficult to define those measures of comfort. And probably one of the best examples that I could find and think of outside of what the psalmist penned here is the life of Job. And we've mentioned him on many occasions, but we always had to refer back to him because of his patience, but also the things that he had to deal deal with, the sorrows that came upon him. When you think about him losing 10 children, and then not only did he lose his children, but the Bible tells us that he lost his wealth in Job 1, 13 through 22. His own body was was racked by boils there in Job 2, 7 through 8. And then his wife even encouraged him to to just curse God and and die. You know, you, you have done something so bad that that would cause God to do this to you, even though God was not doing it. God allowed Satan to do it there in verse 9. But it seemed as if life was just just tumbling around him. And so in Job 2 and verses 11 and following, we read of his three friends that came to mourn with him and to comfort him. And the Bible tells us that for seven days and seven nights, no one said a word. Now I found that interesting if you think about it. Seven days and seven nights They basically are looking at at each other and no one said a word. I would imagine that Job found it very difficult in that setting to find any measure of comfort. 
I just know that I would probably be jumping out of my skin by, about that time. And so it may be the case that you today are experiencing some trials and tribulations and maybe you have felt like Job or maybe you have been in the shoes of the psalmist and you have been discomforted as well. But then not only was he discomforted, we learned that he was de deluged. Look at verse 3. He says, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Have you ever faced times in life when, you, when you've had the feeling that you were just drowning in a very sea of problems or a sea of troubles? You know, there are people in our world today and even in this country who, if they were honest about their physical state or about their mental state, they would tell you that they are drowning. They're drowning in a sea of trouble. That was really the picture that the psalmist was writing for his readers many, many centuries ago. He said, I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Even though we are the people of God and even though we have the assurance that, that God is on our side, we understand that problems and trials and tribulations are going to come our way. It's just guaranteed they will come our way. And we know that sometimes those trials, sometimes those tribulations, if you will, can mount in life and thus leave us with a, an overwhelmed spirit, an overwhelmed attitude. But then there's the third thing that he points out, that not only was he discomforted and deluged, but he says he was dumbstruck. And, and by this, I mean, he was speechless. Look at verse four. Thou beholdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Have you ever been so troubled or faced such a traumatic situation in life that you're just literally speechless? Now, now maybe that's hard for us to really, to, to wrap our minds around but there are people that have received word from legal authorities or from a law enforcement officials that a loved one has been killed on the, on the highway. And it was not that long ago that Tay Willis learned about her father passing away unexpectedly about November 10th. And then eight days later, she was able to give birth to twin boys and uh, Charlie. But another 10 days later, they got word that Charlie's father in South Carolina had died. I, I, I was somewhat speechless to learn of that and to know that, that her father dies just before the second set of twins. And then shortly afterward that Charlie's dad died right after the, the birth of those twins. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. What do you say to those who are on the receiving end of news just like that? Sometimes it's hard even for them to articulate, articulate what they think or what their thoughts may be. Well, that was the situation that the psalmist here was experiencing in his day and time. And so he was discomforted. He was deluged and he was dumbstruck. But now he writes of his sorrows in life, but then he also speaks of his supplications to the Lord. And when we talk about his supplication to the Lord, let me first of all point out his purpose for praying. His purpose for praying. When you and I face trials and tribulations and difficulties in life, what do we do? Well, what we need to do is we need to take it to God, don't we? We need to go to God in prayer. Let's look at what the psalmist said here in verse 1 again. Oh, Psalm 77. He says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. Now, we know that one of the reassuring things that all of us ought to contemplate from time to time is that privilege, that is that power of prayer. We have 
that. And when we go to God in prayer, there ought to be a purpose for that. You know, when Paul wrote to the saints in Philippi, he said to be careful or be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, Philippians 4, 6. Now, all of us have reason or have multiple reasons, if you please, to pray. All of us have some reason why we need to pray. But there are times when life seems as if it's just tumbling and crumbling right around us. And it is in those moments of life that we ought to get down on our hands and our knees and pray to Almighty God with a purpose. Think about Jesus, the Christ, when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. The cross was looming before him. He was about to bear the sins of the human family. And so we find Jesus bowing in the very presence of, of God, the Father, and praying some three times, Oh, my Father, if it be possible to let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. You see, Jesus was praying to God the Father. Now, if Jesus set that kind of example for us, surely in times of trial, in times of adversity, hopefully we could see the need for prayer and to pray. But then also note, if you will, his persistence in prayer. He said in verse 2, notice, In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My soul ran in the night and ceased not. He was praying because of a trial, because of trouble. And I think about Jesus spending the night, as Luke tells us in Luke 6 and verse 12, in prayer to God the Father. Of course, in Mark 1 and verse 35, we read about Jesus rising up early in the morning and going out into that solitary place and there praying to the Father. Well, here was a man who was persistent in his prayer to Almighty God. Now, Jesus said that men ought always to pray and not to faint, Luke 18, 1. And so here was a man who was bowing in prayer to God the Father, and there was purpose behind his prayer. But then in the second place, I call your attention not to just his trials, but also his trepidation. That is, it has to do with his anxieties. Right? Sometimes when we face the difficulties of life, sometimes when we are run through the mill, so to speak, we are somewhat filled to some extent with anxieties or a sense of trepidation. There are two things that come to mind as we look at verses 5 through 9. First of all, he was contemplative. And not only was he contemplative, but he was concerned. Let's notice verses 5 and 6. He says, I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart and my spirit made diligent search. When we face the trials of life and when, we, when our spirit, like the psalmist, is overwhelmed, when we feel like we're just being overrun, overrun with trials and difficult circumstances in life. Sometimes it brings about a contemplative spirit. And it helps to shape us and to really bring into focus what was really important in life. And it helps us to weed out those things that are less important, doesn't it? It helps us to, to see what are the mundane things of life as opposed to those things that really take precedence and priority. And so the psalmist here is somewhat introspective. And then notice verses 7 through 9 as we think about his grave concern. If he was in captivity, and I believe that the psalmist would have been numbered among the exiles in Babylon, he asked this question in verse 7. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy 
clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? And hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? You, you see, the psalmist was concerned about his state, and it would only stand to reason. Because here was a man among many who was in exile, and God's people had been deported into Babylon. There were three waves of Babylonian captivity, and they were sent away for some 70 years, and some 70 years later, in about 539 to 538 B.C. God allowed his people to return back to their homeland under the edict of Cyrus, the the king of Persia. But nonetheless, while these people were in exile, you can only imagine the anxieties that they were experiencing. And, and even the concern that they had to wonder probably within themselves. To ask those questions. Has God cast us off forever? Will he no longer be favorable to us? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? He, has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? I couldn't even imagine. Well, here's what the psalmist came to understand, and this is what we need to understand. And that is that God is in complete control. God is in complete control. Absolute complete control. He was in control when they were sent into Babylonian captivity. And just because he punished them did not mean that he had cast them off forever. In a sense, it did not mean that he had forgotten about them. It did not mean that he had forgotten about the promises that he had made to them. It would ultimately be through that remnant in the southern kingdom that the Messiah would emerge. God needed a remnant to bring the Christ into the world, and thus he accomplished that. Now, Israel had a very specific purpose. They were to have been a light to the Gentile people, based on what Isaiah said in the long ago. But they were also the nation through whom that Christ would come into this world. And so the Lord would continue to be gracious, but he would also be kind to them. He would remember his promises to them. There are those times in life when we face the difficulties and when we face the trials and maybe we even question, is God even there? Is God concerned about my plight in life? Does God understand what I'm dealing with? Will God be gracious to me? Will God remember me in the midst of the difficulties that I'm facing in life? But again, we need to remember God is in control. I've said it before that we might not know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. And that's God. God is in absolute control. That's why the, the psalmist could say on two different occasions that the Lord reigns. And so we think about the fact that the Lord was indeed in control and that he is in control even today. But then thirdly, not only the trials, not only the trepidation, but notice, if you will, his thoughts. And what the psalmist does is that he assesses the situation. The first thing that he does is he calls to remembrance the great might of Almighty God. And not just the might of God, but also the majesty of God. Notice what he said in verse 10 and following. And I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. 
I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary who is so great a God as our God. Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. The psalmist here brings to remembrance the majesty of Almighty God, the fact that he is great, that he is the greatest. If someone were to ask you to just jot down the greatness of God, what would you write? What would you write? If someone were to ask you to verbalize the very greatness and the majesty of God, what would you write? How would you explain it? The psalmist here talks about the greatness of Almighty God. But as he remembers God, here's what he brings to the forefront. And that is the redemption that is provided by God. Here we see the might of Almighty God. Look at verse 14 and following. Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw thee, O God. The waters saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The 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 sky sent out a sound. Then thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. Thy way is in the sea and thy path is in the great waters. And thy footsteps are not known. Thou lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. I believe what the psalmist is recalling here is God's very redemptive powers at work. When Israel came forth out of Egyptian bondage, when you go back and you read the book of Exodus, you will see that God's people had been in Egyptian bondage and they were serving Pharaoh. And Pharaoh had made their bondage one of great rigor. And God said, in the long ago, I've seen your tears, I've heard your cries and your prayers to me. And thus God called on to two men by the name of Moses and Aaron, both brothers. He called on these two men to be the instruments to be able to lead his people out of Egyptian bondage. Now, did God accomplish that? Yes, indeed he did. Moses would write in Exodus 19 in verse 4. How God had bore them on eagles, eagles' wings and brought them unto himself and thus entered into a covenant relationship with these people. God blessed the nation of Israel. But when the psalmist reflected upon what God had done in the past, surely that gave him hope. That the same God that had the power to redeem his people in the days gone by could redeem them. And so what we need to take from this is that God is still at work. The same God who demonstrated his power in Egypt, who demonstrated his power when his people were set forth into Babylonian captivity and thus released, he is still the God that is working today. And God can help us when we feel, as the psalmist did, that we are literally just overrun and overwhelmed by the anxieties and by the trials and the tribulations in this life. We might not necessarily understand everything that's going on in our lives. We might not be able to articulate some, to some degree exactly how we feel or what we're experiencing but we need to take from this is that God is still in control no matter what. And God is standing there on our side and the promises of God have not failed us. God said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. And then I think about the, the words of Peter in 1 Peter 5, 7, when he said, Casting all your care upon him. Why? Because he careth for you. There's not another person on this earth that will care for you like Almighty God. There's not another person on earth that has your best interest at heart like Almighty God. Now I think about the parent-child relationship and, and how we want what is best for our children. We look out for them. We, we care for them. We look out for their welfare, their well-being. We, we want the very best for them. We are the people of God, and God is our Heavenly Father. And as our Heavenly Father, He wants what is just absolutely best for us in this life. God is not to leave us stranded. He's not going to, to walk away and just leave us there to fend for ourselves, figure it out. No. Now, that, it may be the case that we choose to walk away from Him, but guess what? He'll never leave us. In other words, when we're ready to come back to Him, He will always be there, ready to accept us into His loving arms. That's right. God is accessible. So we ought to take great comfort we ought to be encouraged to know that God will stand with us when those difficulties arise. And so the psalmist said in verse 1, he says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. God is accessible. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews four sixteen, he says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that wonderful? God wants us to turn to Him in the times of difficulties. It may be the case that we're overwhelmed in life. It may be the case that there, may, there will be many occasions in life when we will have that sinking feeling that sometimes that something's a missing, right? That we're overwhelmed by the troubles and the trials of life. We may be overwhelmed, but we may not be overcome. Why? Because God will stand with us. I like the words of the psalmist in Psalm 56 and the long ago when he said, I know God is for me. I know God is for me. God is on our side. God is for us, and he'll stand with us come what may. In closing, let me ask you this question. What is your life like tonight? Are you besieged by the very trials and the tribulations and the very troubles of life? If your answer is yes, then let me, let me ask another question. Do you have God on your side? That's an important question. Do you have the one who created the world in your corner? Do you have the privilege, the right to turn to him in prayer with the assurance that he's going to hear your prayers and answer accordingly? Prayer is a wonderful thing. And the Bible speaks to those who turn to God in prayer like the psalmist said, oh, We'll be able to have that access to God. It may be the case that you're not a Christian even tonight. And if you're not a Christian, you're, you're not going to be able to enjoy all the spiritual blessings that are found in Christ until you come to Christ. One of those spiritual blessings is prayer. Ephesians 1, 3. The good news is that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Uh, yes, he died for my sins as well. And he wants, 
He wants you and us to become members of his family. But in order to become a child of God, you're going to have to first believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what the Bible tells us. You must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We had to put our faith and our trust in him as being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then we're called upon to repent and turn from life of sin, as Peter said in Acts 2 and verse 38. The Bible then tells us that we are to confess with the mouth what we believe in our heart, that Jesus is the Son of God, just like the eunuch did in Acts 8, 37. The Bible then says we're to be immersed in water, that is, That is that we're to be baptized into Christ so that your sins might be washed away, Acts 22, 16. You know, it's it's interesting that so many have already heard this but seem to have turned their deaf ear to it. But I hope that you're one tonight that won't turn a deaf ear. That you will take what has been said and, and what God has instructed for us and that you will... Take listen and take heed and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might be already a child of God. You might have already put your faith and trust in Jesus. You might have already repented of those sins that have come back into your life. We hope that you have. But the next thing is that you have to pray and use that very privilege and Pray to God with purpose and allow God to know that you want him not by your side. Repent and pray. We hope that we can help you to either obey the gospel tonight or maybe to be restored back to that first love with God in Christ once again. We hope that you'll make that decision even tonight. Call us, write us, text us, let us know so that we can help you in everything.